Three years ago, John Horgan, then a senior writer for the Scientific American, caused quite a stir with a book called The End of Science. In it, he argued that scientific inquiry had pretty much run its course and that questions left unanswered would probably remain unanswered. He has now followed up that controversial work with a new book called The Undiscovered Mind, How the Human Mind Defies Replication, Medication, and Explanation. I'm pleased to have John Horgan back on this broadcast. Welcome back. Nice to be here. Uh, tell me about, first of all, why the end of science attracted so much controversy. Well, first of all, I was delighted that it did. Uh, I, I suspected that it would because even when I was working on the book, I would meet people at cocktail parties, not just scientists, but lawyers, doctors, anyone, and I would tell them that I was working on a book that was going to argue that uh, this great run of scientific progress that we've had might come to an end. The universal reaction was that I had to be out of my mind. And, and not only that, un-American. Yes, right. Because... We worship progress right. in we this are. country, and we have had extraordinary progress over the last hundred years, both pure scientific progress and technological progress. And I think we've come to believe that it has to continue. We're so immersed in images of progress that we think that it's, it's eternal now. And I believe that. Do you believe? Uh, most people do. I believe that. Most people do. I believed it at one point myself, uh, but science itself tells me that there are limits to what we can learn through science. And my analysis of what science is doing now tells me that those limits are approaching quite fast. Where are they? Where are the limits? Yeah. In which fields? In any field. For example, in particle physics, um, particle physicists now are trying to create what's known as a grand unified theory that would uh, explain not only uh, how particles interact. It wouldn't only explain electromagnetism and the nuclear forces, but would also explain gravity. Right now we have quantum mechanics, which explains how particle worked, particles work, and we have relativity theory, which explains gravity. Particle physicists want to have one tidy theory that unifies everything. Right. To do that, they've created uh, a theory called superstrings, which postulates that there are these little tiny loops of energy and in 10 dimensions of space, it is not something that can ever be conceivably verified by experiment. Would it's you believe we've discussed this on this program? Yes, yes, I remember that. <laughs> oh, with uh, Brian Greene? Yes, with Brian. Ah, right. right, yes, right. he's a very uh, poetic uh, and um, persuasive proselytizer for superstring theory, but I think if you press him, even he will admit that this is a theory that can't be verified in the same way that the theories we have now can be verified. These superstrings can never be detected in any possible experiment. These extra dimensions of space and time can't be detected. It's a theory that really survives because of its ma mathematical consistency, and that's not science anymore, it's philosophy. So, I mean, everybody reacted as I did, is that your organ's out of his mind. I mean, if he thinks that there's not a whole lot that we don't know in science. Well, certainly and there is a lot left to learn, but what I was arguing was that science in this mode of grand discovery, science that's providing these tremendous insights into nature like relativity and quantum mechanics and natural selection and DNA genetics, that kind of science is over. And in the future we're going to be more or less filling in details and extending the theories that we already have. The last great, what would you think that the last great frontier was uh, the dis discovery of the double helix? That was certainly up there. The Big Bang Theory was also right. a big one. That's really only been in the last 50 years that yeah. we've confirmed that. But I do think that the last great frontier for research is the human mind and brain. So that's what led you to the brain. Right. And that was one of the criticisms of my first book. Uh, there were some critics who said they, they pretty much granted that maybe particle physics and cosmology right. and evolutionary biology might have passed their peaks. But they said the science of the human mind and brain surely will have all sorts of revolutionary discoveries in the future. And I did cover that in The End of Science, but I really just talked about the search for a theory of consciousness, mm -hmm. which is really just one part of all the range of mind-related research. So I decided to write a, a book that would look not just at consciousness, but also attempts to find better treatments for mental illness or better theories of mental illness. 
I wanted to look at attempts to replicate uh, the human mind in machines, that's artificial intelligence. I wanted to look at the attempt to, f to uh, unravel the contributions of nature and nurture to human personality. That's uh, a field called behavioral genetics. So I saw, decided to look at all these things in much more detail and assess what they've done so far and what their prospects are for the future. And so? I concluded, I guess not surprisingly, that uh, the that record... You were right in the first place. Yes, yes. That you concluded. Surprise, surprise. Um, the record really has been very poor so far, especially when compared to all the exaggerated claims and hype made for some of these fields. And uh, I certainly hope there will be progress in the future, especially when it comes to better treatments for mental illness. But I don't think it's premature to suggest at this point that in certain respects the mind might just be scientifically intractable. We might not be able to really comprehend it the way we want to. Wait, you, you believe that's true? or I, you? I believe that's true. I'm proposing that. Yeah. On the other hand, I would hate for that to become a self-fulfilling prophecy. Obviously, this kind of research has to continue. Uh, it's the consequences of mind-related science are so vast. Uh, the potential good is so tremendous that we have to keep doing it. Just something like a cure for schizophrenia would be immensely valuable. So we can never stop looking for these things. Oh, man. I, I think we have just begun, begun to scratch the surface of understanding brain chemistry to take one. This is what, it's one of the common um, arguments uh, against what I'm saying is that right. this kind of research is just beginning. Exactly. How can you say it's over when right. it's just starting? And that's not true, actually. Uh, the history but, I mean, of... Just the, the capacity to measure... We just have the tools we do for have, a small time, for do, a short time. We do have some very powerful tools that have just come online in the last 20 years or so. Brain scanners and, and micro you are a Luddite. <laughs> no, I'm not. You are. Absolutely not. No, I am not a Luddite. I I'm believe Luddite. very much in, in science and technology. Uh, I have a, uh, I'm very fond of my laptop computer and my, my fax machine. Uh, I would love to see better treatments for mental illness. So what do you want to do? You want to say to all those young, all those young students coming out of med school and getting their PhDs in science and in medicine and in uh, genetics and in computer sciences and all of that, yeah. it's silly. Forget it because it's over. The questions are unanswerable or they've been answered. So therefore, just go out and, and become a banker. Good question. You know, I was actually invited to give a speech at MIT to the incoming freshman class. Right. Um, and and your, the title of the speech would be, Why Are You Here? Yeah, yeah I, to tell you the truth, I was a little baffled as to why they invited me. I thought it was some kind of strange joke. And it worries me that my message might be perceived as, as so negative that it turns young people off from science. And really, honestly, that is the last thing that I would intend. Um, I believe that science criticism has a place because bad theories can have damaging consequences. I think that the, our dependence of, on, uh, on drugs right now has gotten way out of hand. Uh, psychopharmacology is much too powerful in psychiatry. In the past, we've had theories you like mean, eugenics. You think lithium is too powerful? Lithium is a very problematic drug. It was once touted as a virtual cure for manic depression. It's far from that. Yeah, but I guarantee, listen, before you start down that road, I can tell you that there are a lot of people, if they did not believe, if they did not have lithium, they would be either manic or depressive tomorrow, and they're, uh, two weeks later, it's suicide. That's the theory. I think we're better, and I say in my book, I think we're better having these drugs than not having them but the drugs are far from perfect, and any psychiatrist so will tell you that. So therefore, there's more room to make them perfect. Come on, I mean, that's exactly right. why. Exactly, and I do think yeah. that we need this kind of research to continue. I guess what I hope to accomplish with my criticism is to raise the standards of evidence for these theories of human nature and these treatments that we apply to ourselves so that we don't 
go running off with the latest fad, whether it's psychoanalysis or But I don't hear that people are blue skying these kinds of things. I mean, I find that the people engage in, okay, I know you look at me incredulously. <laughs> the, I find the people engaged in these inquiries are very, very sincere, very uh, engaged by the legitimate search for answers. It depends. Uh, Maybe when they're talking to you, they're relatively modest. In my book, I talk about, uh, for example, behavioral genetics. This is the field that is giving us the gene for gayness or schizophrenia or manic depression or impulsive behavior. I mean, you've seen those stories. They, yeah. they Do you believe out. there's a gene for manic depression? Uh, the evidence uh, for a gene for manic depression is very flimsy. What generally happens is that you get one study of a single population well, that finds it, the next study doesn't find okay, it. Okay, my point is actually, first of all, it's probably not one gene. I mean, that was a misstatement from the beginning. It's probably many genes. I do think that genes contribute to personality and to mental illness. Contribute to personality? Con contribute. I would hope so. But experience has been downgraded as a contributor to personality over the last few decades right. as genetics has become more powerful. And it's gone too far in the direction of genes. And I think it's, uh, it's important for us to remember that experience is still uh, a large contributor. And the research that is supporting the genetic paradigm is really not very good. That's what I'm trying to show in the book. And it's not just my argument. I try to show that the science itself tells us that. When you took this idea to your literary agent, following on the heels of the other book, The End of Science. According to Lore, the literary agent said to you, what's the upside? <laughs> we don't want to leave them depressed. Right. And what did you say? I came up with two upsides. The first upside, and I think I've already touched on this, is that we have this passion to know about ourselves, and there's a danger that we will seize on supposedly scientific theories of human nature that are re really pseudo-theories. And these theories can have damaging consequences. We've seen that with Marxism. We've seen it with eugenics, which uh, mutated into Nazism. Right. I think we're seeing it now with an excessive prescription of uh, psychiatric drugs. We've seen it with... Like Prozac, is that your principle? Prozac, the largest market the fastest growing market for Prozac now is children under the age of 12. But who's giving it to them? The psychiatrists, of course. Yeah. And In order to do what? To even out their moods or what? What's uh, the yeah, idea? I, I've got two kids. I know kids can drive you crazy. And I think that uh, some of the normal vicissitudes of childhood are now being treated with these drugs. And the problem is that there's no evidence that they actually work. Also, there's no knowledge of the long-term consequences. So anyway, one upside yeah. of my book is to make us more skeptical and less gullible, less susceptible to these theories of everything that tell us, purport to tell us who we are and even who we should be. Where are you in religion? Uh, let's see, what would I be? Um, I don't know, a lapsed Catholic and now uh, <laughs> a seeker. Ah, a seeker. <laughs> yes, a seeker. A seeker of, of something that means that's meaningful to you? Yeah, I guess... That would be fair to say. I mean, are you, is this an active search, or are you just waiting for it to happen? Actually, it's an active search, and it, it even uh, coincides with my career interests. I'm just starting a book on mysticism. Oh, great. And, and you find that relevant and, and influential? Well, is this... both of my, my first two books took me to the edge of mysticism. Uh, what I realized in talking to scientists for the end of science was that a lot of scientists are looking for some sort of absolute truth, for some sort of blinding revelation that lies beyond what science can give. They were really looking for some kind of mystical truth. And the same issue came up in my recent book on mind-related research. There were some scientists who thought that maybe the next great step forward would, would come out of uh, Buddhism or research on psychedelic drugs or... Uh, Anyway, explorations of the mystical realm. So I took that seriously enough to decide to write a book yeah. on it. You also seem to come to this conclusion. By the way, the name of this book is The Undiscovered Mind, How the Human Brain Defies Replication, Medication, and Explanations. 
I mean, this, this, you do come away with this with a kind of wonderment at the human brain, don't you? Yeah, I hope so. Uh, I, um, I guess uh, one of the ideas that I wanted to, to convey in the book was that there are other ways of understanding ourselves besides science. Uh, Shakespeare is argu arguably the greatest theorist of the, of the human psyche who ever lived. Even nowadays, you have some scientists who are brilliant writers in a literary sense, like Oliver Sacks, the neurologist, right. who they get at our brains and minds, not just with scientific theory, but uh, with poetry and uh, metaphor. There are some scientists whom I quote in the book who think that that might be the only way to go in the future, have a kind of quasi-literary, quasi-scientific, uh, this weird hybrid for understanding our brains. And interestingly, that's what Freud was, too, a great writer who also happened to be a scientist. Some might want to come along and say two things about this. A, you're anti-intellectual, in the best sense of the word, not in terms of, you know, look at me how smart I am, but you're anti-intellectual in terms of, you know, the, the, the journey of discovery. In other words, saying that the journey, denigrating the journey of discovery. Right. Saying it, forget it, it's futile, it's over, to there's me, nothing to learn. Well, first of all, I, I, as I said before, I, I am not recommending that Congress pull the plug on all neuroscience and cognitive science and so yeah, forth. I hope not, because, think, you know, there's somebody sitting somewhere who's going to discover the cure to cancer, right? Right. Somebody is going to do that. Let's hope. Well, uh, um, I believe that. And, but part know. of the journey of discovery, I think, is also recognizing our limits. And that's what science is about. Science is a self-critical process. What bothers me about much of the coverage of science nowadays is that it's too much cheerleading and too much of this worshipful attitude toward progress. And I think we need right. more of this questioning. More, more realness. Yeah. I mean, understanding limits has never been something that I've been particularly comfortable with. So that may be my own bent. Well, I think uh, your attitude is shared by, by most people in our <laughs> culture. Which, and you think that's unhealthy. I just think that my perspective can enrich the dialogue over uh, where I, we're I, going. Granted, you know, because the, 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 the height of, of, of anti-intellectualism would be to dismiss you for the wrong reasons. I feel like and if, I've, in fact, you engage the idea, then you serve a purpose. I feel as though some of the dismissal of what I'm saying is, it's almost as though I was presenting some sort of heresy uh, within a church where absolute the faith church of is progress. The, the church of progress. This book, again, uh, The Undiscovered Mind, How the Human Brain Defies Replication, Medication, and Explanation. I suggest you John Horgan in search of religion as well. Thank you. Pleasure. Thank you. We'll be right back. Stay with us.